With the release of The Witcher on Netflix, many of you are discovering the fantasy world of Geralt of Rivia for the first time. But did you know that some of this fantasy is based in real-world history? Created by Polish author Andrzej Sapkowski and brought to life by Polish video game company CD Projekt and then partially filmed in Poland for the Netflix series, you shouldn't be surprised to hear that The Witcher's medieval fantasy world is actually based on medieval Poland. Besides meaning that everyone involved likely has fond feelings towards kielbasa sausage, the maps of Geralt of Rivia's fantastical realm don't really match up to any Poland that I know until you rotate it 90 degrees and then it actually looks pretty familiar. The borders of the kingdoms in the Witcher world seem to be drawn from the different dialects of spoken Polish, which in turn reflect early medieval provinces. From the architecture to the names of the characters to the names of the cities, the series' creator drew on the Polish and Slavic culture he was raised in to create his fantasy world, though it does raise some questions about what he got up to in the 70s. I, uh... You apple juice. And that the kingdoms have Polish origins is not exactly subtly alluded to in the white and red heraldry of Redania, which literally uses the exact same heraldry as the historic province and boasts the same fetching Polish eagle. The Skellig Isles would normally sit between Poland and Norway in the real world, so their Norse Viking inspired feel in the games and books is intentional, though it is curious that the show didn't play this up as much. I mean, sure, we have a big red haired Scotsman, but it's not quite the same, and I suspect we'll see a bit more cultural variation if we ever go to the Skellig Isles in future seasons. Tuasant, the realm of warmth, wines, and errant nights, sits beyond a range of mountains just like northern Italy, and draws upon it to depict an idyllic world of the late Middle Ages, complete with nearly fairy tale levels of castles, damsels, and knights in extremely shiny armor. Sintra, though, is actually represented pretty spot on, and correlates roughly to the historic province of Silesia an area that was rich in mineral and natural resources, and of course that also painted a giant target on its back, so that by the 1300s this Polish state had been conquered by the neighboring state of Bohemia, who ruled over it for 400 years with a lion rampant as their personal sigil, making them clear cousins of the Lions of Sintra. They would only fall when a new empire rose up in Europe, which threatened to crush everything in Poland under its heel. Which brings us to the series' big bad, Nilfgaard. Its name seems to be a combination of Old Norse terms, Niffle meaning darkness, and Gar meaning, well, place. So there's a reason why they're all wearing black scrotum armor in the show. Well, I mean, there's a reason it's black anyway. The most likely analogs from Nilfgaard here are the Holy Roman Empire and, from much later in history, the rise of the Kingdom of Prussia, which is what took out Bohemia. And both of these empires had a penchant for gold and black coloring and goose-stepping into Polish lands without permission at multiple points in history. It's also interesting to note that the Holy Roman Empire was technically the empire of the Pope and helped to spread Christianity across Eastern Europe sometimes forcibly, like with the Northern Crusades, which certainly sounds similar to the monotheistic crusade of the Nilfgaardians. A fun accompanying fact to this is the free city of Novigrad. In the Witcher series, Novigrad is a city independent of a kingdom, which is sort of curious when you think about it, a city becoming its own nation. But Poland actually had this happen with the city of Danzig after World War I. The region of Gdansk was culturally very German, so they decided to found their own independent city nation. Not only that, but Gdansk used to be a major power base of the Teutonic Knights. They were an order of warrior monks who charged headlong into the Northern Crusade. And in The Witcher, this shows up as the Order of the Flaming Rose, a military cult that worships the eternal fire and squashes heretics from their base in Novigrad, which is another interesting parallel. The Witchers themselves also have parallels with the Teutonic Knights. After all, they're a secret sect of warrior monks sworn to celibacy that hunt out their demons on the fringes of society and they were nearly entirely populated by the second and third sons of major lords who didn't know what else to do with them and so forced them to join. And that the Witcher's headquarters of Kaer Morin is located so far to the south near what we would call Romania also has fun implications for monster hunting as well. 
Silver weapons and magic potions are staples of medieval alchemy, and many believed in the era that the most potent of these were made from the corpses of humans and exotic animals, something a budding witcher would sagely not agreement with. But to me, the most likely origin for witchers are the traveling executioners of the Middle Ages. These transient headsmen were pariahs who were shunned by society, whose job it was to travel from town to town to interrogate and torture criminals and ultimately to kill them for coin. And often this entailed investigating tales of witchcraft and dark magics. One of the more famous cases is actually Peter Stump, the werewolf of Bedeburg, accused of witchcraft and cannibalism, who admitted to putting on a belt given to him by the devil to transform into a savage wolf who then killed and ate 14 children. The whole thing sounds incredibly fantastic to us today, but people reading 400 years from now are unlikely to believe the son of Sam or John Wade Gacy could exist either. Regardless, there was definitely a job in the medieval world that involved hunting monsters. The Slavic folklore and myth behind the monsters of the Witcher, though, is so extensive that it honestly deserves its own video. But one surprising aspect of it is actually quite historical, the Wild Hunt. Anyone familiar with the games and books knows that the show will soon reveal the Wild Hunt, a cabal of elves who hunt their prey through time and space, described by commoners as a spectral horde that gallops across the sky, who will carry off any in their path and bring with them portents of great doom. But the thing is, the Wild Hunt is actually recorded in history. In England in AD 1127, an abbot and many others saw a great black cloud roll into their valley, and with it, a horde of huntsmen on huge, hideous black horses chasing black hounds. They ranged from Petersboro to Stamford, sounding their horns and shouting their way through the entire valley. And even the respected scholar Orderic Vitalis recorded that the Herlikens troop the Wild Hunt of Normandy, swept through Normandy in January of 1091, hooting and hollering as they went. Always they appeared in midwinter, the cold, dark, and eerie silence of the European frosts personified, hinting at a world beyond what we could see with reason alone. The magical hierarchy and structure of the Witcher world, with the Brotherhood of Sorcerers and later the Lodge of Sorceresses, draws inspiration from the monastic system of medieval Europe, where children were taken in by the monasteries to be trained in nearly magical arts to the average peasant, reading, writing, and the sciences. Jennifer of Vengerberg herself is depicted with obvious physical disabilities, the sort of thing which would make finding a traditional marriage in the medieval world difficult, so it was not uncommon for families to donate these children to the church, where they stood a better chance to create a life for themselves as monks or nuns who, in an interesting parallel, were forbidden from creating children of their own. Though the magic in the show is fantastic, many nuns became healers and nurses and would offer these services to their local communities, from treatments of wounds to ailments and even impotency, as we see Jennifer do in the Netflix show. And the top among these would even act as aides and advisors to the local rulers of the kingdom. And that's some of the real history behind the world of the Witcher. Or am I completely wrong about it all? That's the fun thing about fantasy. It takes inspiration from the real and changes it to create fun stories to debate and discuss. So leave your thoughts on the inspirations behind the Witcher below. And thanks for watching. Do not tell me that this is finally the moment you've decided to actually care about someone other than yourself. Don't touch Roach.